Welcome to the New Trust Economy, where your hosts, Blockchain 101 author and founder of Rise Housing, Monica Profit, and Inc. innovation columnist and brand casting strategist, Tracy Hazard, explore all things blockchain, ICO ventures, and cryptocurrency. Each week, they explore businesses, applications, and venture built on blockchain or cryptocurrency and address issues like women and diversity in tech, trust and distrust, and the economics of access and value. We would like to remind our listeners that investing in disruptive tech, ICOs, and cryptocurrency is speculative in nature and involves substantial risk of loss. We encourage you to invest carefully and do your due diligence first. Now, here are your hosts, Monica Profit and Tracy Hazard. Hello, and welcome to the New Trust Economy. I'm Monica Profit, and I'm here with Irina Burkhan. She's the Managing Director of Golden Seeds and IBLS Global. Thank you so much, Irina, for meeting with me. Thank you, Monica. It's great to see you. Yeah, it's nice to see you as well. I feel like we're in so many chat rooms and we see each other at so many conferences that, you know, this is so formal compared to how I usually just run into you. So it's, it's nice to see you <laughs> on video. Um, I realize that you you kind of have two main components to your to your connections to blockchain right now, and they're through the two uh, managing director positions that you have with Golden Seeds as well as IBLS. Can you talk a little bit about the differences between these two companies that you are closely involved with? Sure. So um, IBLS Global is a company that I launched uh, about a year ago, and it is a CFO, CEO, and a legal consulting firm. Uh, where I help companies with their back office, finance, legal operations. And most of my clients are cross-border between U.S. and Europe. Uh, so I take a company, I bring them to the country, get them set up, um, get them operational, make sure that they're in compliance with all the regulations and kind of help them on their way to um, achieve any of the goals that they have. You know, sometimes their goals are fundraising. Sometimes their goals are um, expanding their markets for their products. Um, and so we work with them on different projects like that. I have a team and you know, we, we're, we're very excited because we have a lot of big diversity of our clients. We range from blockchain, cybersecurity, MarTech, um, data science. So we, we're kind of a little bit in everything. Um, and uh, Golden Seeds is a, uh, an angel fund in the US. We have a little over 300 members. Uh, where we get together and invest in companies that are women-led. Uh, one of our very important criteria is an executive or founder has to be a woman in order for us to invest in the company. That's really interesting. I've, I've read some um, articles about profitability and, and returns that can be expected or that have been expected in the three to five year range of invested in companies and whether a woman was leading them or not. Mm -hmm. um, of course, we all know that there are a lot of specific challenges to raising money as a woman. I can speak to those myself. I'm sure you've seen them <laughs> from both sides before. But what are some of the things that you're looking to solve? What are the challenges that you saw that you particularly wanted to, to look at? Was it really just that you knew you were missing out on a profitability or was it something else that you wanted to change? Um, so the way I like to talk about it is there are two reasons that we do it and you know, maybe personally I do it. So one of the reasons is it is very difficult for women to raise money. There is statistics about it. You know, Only 35% of uh, companies that come to angels get funding. Uh, they're, they're women-led. You know, when it comes to VCs, that's a much smaller number. You know, only 2% of the companies that VCs fund are women-led. So it is more difficult. There are various reasons for that, which you know, we at Golden Seeds look into, and um, as a whole in the US, we look into what the reasons are and try to solve those reasons. Um, the other uh, way I look at it is, there is also very much statistics about companies that are women-run performing better. Not, they don't have to be necessarily women-founded, but if there is an executive of, on the team that's a woman, uh, statistically or you know historically the company is um, run better you know they need less funding to succeed they can do more with funds that they raise you know they're more innovative um, there's a lot of you know, very positive criteria so you know we see ourselves as kind of securing our money that way by ensuring <laughs> there is this um, woman or somebody in the, on the executive team that we know will get the company um, to the right place faster um, so that's the reason I joined the fund. 
And is that a common that you feel as though most of the women or most of the people that have joined this fund um, know specifically someone on the teams of, of companies that you're, that you're going to invest in, that they know that they're going to be, you know, well stewarded by these women? Or is it, is it actually a broader net that you cast beyond a, a network of, of people that you know? Yeah, it, it's a it's a much broader net. So the fund has been around for 15 years. We've invested in about 180 companies, I, I think, throughout this time. Um, so it's, you know, we don't usually know the women that come to us or the teams that come to us. We have a lot of, um, you know, ways to, you know, de deal flow ways to bring um, businesses in. But what we do is we do a lot of coaching. We do a lot of advising. You know, we sit on the boards of most of the companies we um invest in you know whether it's advisory boards or um, otherwise um you know th this is one of our thesis criteria you know this is one of the things that we look for in a company we want to invest in and what else do you look for in companies that you want to invest in it has to be female uh led to some degree there's got to be um some opportunity for you to sit on the board and yeah. what other are other things i mean that we are investors so we want to make money you know it's not we're not a charity organization that just people so we have a pretty strict criteria you know just like any angel investment fund um, we look for you know the top companies in the space when they come to us whether it's technology you know, we invest in medical um, field, medical devices, we include, invest in consumer products. And, you know, we've had some successes, just like any angel fund, we've had some, you know, companies that did not succeed the way we wanted them to. But um, we, do, we do look at proper businesses. Uh, what I'll say is I, I joined the fund and my goal is to try to bring some um, compliant, legitimate blockchain projects to the fund uh -huh. to invest in, which, Historically, I don't think there's been a lot of investments in that space. And, you know, that's where I kind of cross my IBLS and Golden Seeds hats, where I try to find some projects to work with and bring them to the investors. And how did you first get started in blockchain? Um, so it kind of, you know, we were just talking about living in San Francisco or New York. So I was walking down the street in San Francisco and a blockchain project fell on my head. Um, <laughs> kind of as random as that, you know, I had a friend who, an acquaintance who I met a few times and he uh, started a um, blockchain company and he was doing an ICO and he asked for my help and I saw him on the walking down the street in San Francisco. Um, so I started helping that company with fundraising and, you know, it was marginally successful. It was about a year ago when kind of all the ICOs were pretty much dying <laughs> the, yeah. at, at their, um, you know, market. Um, so I got into it that way. I did a big road show for two months, traveled all over the world, all over conferences, did a, you know, millions of pitches. And after that, I realized that this is a technology that I really want to keep my kind of finger on the pulse of. You know, this is very interesting. We're in the very beginning of it, both from the technical and from the compliance um, standpoint. And, you know, I've been in it ever since in various capacities. What were the first capacities that you were involved in? Was it mostly advisory or were you just sort of a student of it, you know, kind of going from conference to conference, learning and absorbing all that you could? Uh, well, I was the CFO of that company that was raising the money. So I was, as part of IBLS Global, this was one of my clients. So for about four months, I, I was um, running their investment process. for the company. And how did that particular um, project end up going? I mean, ICOs are not something that we hear a lot about firsthand, especially from a CFO perspective. Most mm -hmm. ICOs that I'm, I've ever heard about, and I think most people have heard about, they actually didn't have anybody doing compliant CFO anything. Um, yeah. and it was just sort of like a fly by the seat of your pants sort of situation. So it sounds very unique that you were in a CFO position. So it was a, it was a European company. So after a very short period of time, I realized that there was no way we were going to succeed as, a, as an ICO. Uh, so I recommended to the team to stop the ICO process, which we did, and did a traditional raise. And, and then the team went off to um, you know, use that money to build the product. So the ICO, I mean, we, we can call it failed, but I think it was more of as we learned more about the market and the compliance and the complexities of it, we decided that that was not the right way to go. That makes sense. Yeah, I've uh, I've also seen many companies go that way as well. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so when you talk about your reasons, like 
Um, are there philosophical reasons as well as just investment you know, reasons? I know that there, there was a recent article, not that recent probably anymore, but in the last year or two that came out saying that women, you know, led companies are more profitable, but are there other philosophical reasons or like uh, something larger and broader that has brought you not only to the blockchain space, but to, you know, female founded or female stewarded investments? Um, I mean, I think... I think there's maybe different questions. So for blockchain, what I've realized is um, there are some real application of blockchain that are, you know, being worked on right now. And, then, you know, a lot of the companies are not quite there yet. And, you know, we're comparing ourselves with the dot com and the Internet. How we're still kind of in the in the dial up uh, stage of that. <laughs> um, but what I you know, and I'm not technical, I'm a CFO by trade, so I can't really talk about, you know, whether technology is going to succeed. But what I've seen with um, the application of blockchain and kind of the result of having Bitcoin is, you know, cross-border payments uh, are very important. And they're important, you know, they're important for women because women are minorities and sometimes they don't have the same access to banking. They're important for anyone who is underbanked in the world. And, you know, sometimes it's women, sometimes it's not. Um, you know, right now you can't send a 20 cent wire from the U.S. to, right. you know, Europe. And, you know, to you and me, maybe 20 cents is not a big deal, but to some people it is. And especially in countries where you, there is no banking at all and you can't set up your business, you can't do anything without this. And Bitcoin kind of solved that problem for a lot of those um, countries and, and people. Um, you know, it's, it's, again, it's not going to change my life and maybe your life, you know, living here in the U S we can get any credit card we want, but there are people whose life it could change. And I think if it's done legitimately with proper compliance, with proper technology, that it would be, you know, tremendously beneficial for those people and the rest of the world. That makes sense. So, I mean, I, I know you were talking about uh, being an interim CFO and being in that position, and you said something about your accounting background. Can you speak to, is that what you went to school for? Is that how you started out? Was that, what was your uh, background in terms of accounting and numbers, numbers. CFO-ness? Yeah, so I, I'm a CPA by training. I was, I worked at a public accounting firm for the first 10 years of my career, and then I worked at a company that did an IPO so I was very closely involved with the SEC and kind of the, you know, throughout the accounting career, I was an auditor. So it was a lot of work. Um, you know, my work was mostly done on ensuring that there is compliance with all the regulations, whether it's SEC regulations, banking, um, or you know, Sarbanes-Oxley. Um, so I, I come from that space, you know, I come from the space of here's a rule, we have to follow it. You know, the yeah. SEC has been around for a long time. You know, there is a reason for that. Um, and this digital asset space, this blockchain and crypto is really pushing a lot of boundaries now. It really is. Yeah, and speaking of which, um, you did write an article um, about a recent um, issuing of a, of a ruling that Tell, um, to Telegram by the SEC. Can you talk a little bit about what the article, what's the content, and also what made you want to write it? I think there's an interesting story there. You were in an interesting place to have seen that sudden judgment come out publicly. Yeah, so um, it was very interesting. I was at a conference in Russia a few weeks ago, and um, Blockchain Life, and as part of that conference as a side event, there was also a conference put on um, to, to explore Telegram's um, offering. And there were, I think, investors and other experts there. And, you know, I think literally two days before then that the SEC came out with a complaint that, um, you know, asked Telegram not to issue their token. So there was a lot of anxiety. There were a lot of opinions um, kind of floating around about that. So as I was listening, I would, you know, because I come from the US and, you know, for me, it's no brain, right? Like I understand you have to be compliant if you want to do something. There are, you know, kind of boundaries you can push, but there are rules and regulations. And I was listening to people who are not quite in that space. And to me, it was just this big shock, you know, how could you, know, how, how could you not understand that? Um, so what, the reason I wrote it is just to clarify a few things and a few maybe I don't know, confusions or, you know, I'm not trying to justify either one way or the other. You know, I'm not saying the SEC is right. I'm not saying Telegram is right. There is just a lot of um, 
confusion and a lot of opinions about it. Um, so I started off by explaining that Bitcoin and Ethereum are the ones, you know, the, the ones that, I guess, <laughs> The compliant cryptocurrencies in the US right now are Bitcoin and Ethereum. Uh, there are a couple others that are coming up that are getting certain, um, um, you know, red and green lights from the SEC. And the SEC went on to say why Telegram's token was not. And, you know, it was a security, it's considered a security token. Whether right or wrong, the SEC has, rule, has um, you know, regulations that define whether it's a security or not. And it was defined as a security. And as the result, because it's a security, there are um, report, there's reporting that the company has to do if they're going to sell the security to the public. And you know, that's what I was trying to clarify with that. You know, that that's what the SEC was, I think, trying to do in a very long letter, a very last minute, relatively convoluted way. <laughs> <laughs> and have you seen this kind of judgment come out to um, multiple other companies similarly? Yeah, I think there's been there's been some history with that that you know the SEC came out and either um, asked or ruled on you know EOS got a certain ruling by the SEC and I mean I think EOS so EOS um, EOS got a fine for um, selling securities to um, the U.S. Um, citizens that were outside of the SEC compliance. Do you know what that fine was? So it was, I think it was 24 million. I don't, oh I think so. Yeah. But I mean, that's a drop in the bucket for EOS's um, right. raise. You know, there were other companies who got a much bigger fine, which shut them down as, yeah. as I, um, as I recall. Uh, but the, you know, there were reasons and actually, you know, every time SEC does a ruling like that and something gets solved, it says, sets a precedent. And, you know, unfortunately or fortunately with Telegram, that's exactly what they're doing as well. So with EOS, they did, they set a precedent in terms of, you know, if you do this and then you do this, then you get this outcome. You know, with Telegram now, that is exactly what's going to happen as well. Um, so I have a client who is looking to do a security offering. And after, the, after we together read the SEC complaint and Telegram's response, um, we sat down and kind of started brainstorming of what we need to do to make sure we don't end up in the same situation. And there are, you know, I'm not a lawyer, you know, there are various um, avenues to go um, in to make sure that we don't end up in that um, kind of crossfires. But I think once the Telegram case is resolved, it's going to set a very interesting precedent for everyone else. Absolutely. Yeah. The Telegram president was big too, because their raise was enormous. They were so well positioned to raise. It was so yeah. easy for them, but it wasn't it not really more than just a handful of investors that were U.S. investors that somehow they accepted, right? It was, it was technically with a PPM, they can have under 35 investors on a Reg D anyway. Mm -hmm. So uh, unaccredited investors and they had 34. So it's a really a strange thing to see that they got their hand slapped or their wrist slapped over over 34 investors technically when 35 would be the threshold i noticed that there was like that's a very interesting number that, they, number that they stopped at and yet and still they got this not a judgment but at least this communication right and they raised 460 something million out of i think the, there was a threshold there as well um from the i think the issue and that was part of what i was trying to research and discuss in my article it wasn't even that those investors, it was the fact that Telegram was going to list their token without any lockup immediately after the release on various exchanges, which the U.S. citizens would have access to um, uh -huh. buy it and to trade it. So that was like, from what I understand, the lockup was done on the SAFT, but the lockup was not done on the actual tokens. Uh, even, even not all of the SAFTs had a lockup, which I... Again, I, I didn't see all that, and that was explained from the SEC article. What I was reading in that, that's what I took away from it. And I think there was some misunderstanding in terms of, you know, let's just, you know, some people said, just give back the U.S. Uh, investors money. Um, that wasn't part of the solution. The solution was that it is going to be listed on the exchange before it is a utility token or, you know, for, you know while it's still considered a security, and right. U.S. Uh, investors could get their hands on it, and they unaccredited investors wouldn't be protected at that point. 
So for our listeners, can you just explain what a SAFT is? Because I mean, even a SAFE, people are like, what is that? I mean, these yeah. are not, you know, average people just don't do this. Um, I mean, I don't know if I'm the best person, but I can explain. So the, a SAFT is a piece of paper that says when we release a token, you will get it in here. And it has all the conditions, um, you know, in terms of getting, getting that token. Um, I think, um, go ahead. Can you compare this to a safe? Being an angel investor, I imagine you're very you're very familiar with a safe, and therefore a SAF yeah. is the same thing. But can you compare those two? It's the it's the same thing, but with the SAF, you're getting a token. With a safe, you're getting equity. I think I'm not a lawyer, <laughs> but if, if I when I see those, they're equivalent to me. But when you, you know, with a safe, you're getting an equity of the company when that equity is issued. Right, yeah. And usually it's not digital. It's not usually, it's usually not a digital asset. With a SAFT, it's a digital asset. It's a token that you get. So as an investor, do you typically see, it sounds like SAFTs and SAFTs are kind of what you see sometimes, but maybe that's not um, something that you see often. Uh, do you mostly see companies raising on other vehicles like convertible notes? Yes, it's a very interesting question. Um, at Golden Seeds, we see safes, we see convertible notes and everything, you know, uh, beyond that, you know, when we have price rounds. Um, what's interesting is in California, investors will look at a safe. In New York, they don't want to touch a safe. They want a convertible no note. And, you know, that, that always goes with, you know, East Coast, West Coast, you know, West Coast, we are in it for the entrepreneur, we are looking for the upside, you know, East Coast is calculating how much money they're gonna lose in, you know, right, right away. Yeah. Uh, so safes are less safe for the investor. Convertible notes are, you know, more secure for the investor. Um, I, I've, I've seen some companies run into issues where they can fill their rounds because they weren't issuing the right instrument. Interesting. Uh -huh. So anyway, to to give um, to give a little information for our, our uh, listeners, a convertible note is something where someone can an investor can invest money, give the money to the entrepreneur and and to the founders, the team. It can be spent, but then after a period of time, it can convert into debt that can need to be paid back at a certain rate or because it's been accruing interest. Whereas a safe is, it technically stands for a simple agreement for equity. Mm -hmm. um, so when that's a simple agreement for equity, it says I bought this much of your company and it's mine. And then mm -hmm. it doesn't become dead at any point. It's just, I own it too. And great. I have 10% of your $5 million company. This is what I put in. I put, you know, $500,000 in and that's what I get. Um, and a simple agreement for token means I don't own any equity in your company. It'll never convert to debt, but I, you issued this much token and this many tokens, when they come out, I own this much of them. So I'm going to pre-purchase at some sort of incentivizing rate. This token, this, this currency that you as a company, you're going to make useful or so you say. So those are the three that we're kind of talking about, not to... Um, yeah, well... Just to add to that, it's simple agreement for future equity and for future tokens. So it's it's not it's presumed that we are today we don't have a token and we don't have this equity issued, but in the future we will. And that's another kind of one of those, um, you know, the unsecure or unknowns, right? So right now Telegram was supposed to issue these tokens, the future tokens, on October thirty first, and they didn't. So now those future tokens are going to be issued, you know, according to them. April 30th. So it's kind of a unknown period of time. I mean, usually it's specified, but still it's a very long or unknown period of time until you actually get that equity or the token that you are invested in via safe. Yeah. Whereas a convertible note has a time frame, right? This note is for two years. After those two years, you either repay it or you convert to equity. And here's the interest and whatever other terms you, you have. Yeah, exactly. It's so funny because I've talked to people, uh, mostly attorneys in the in this space, and and they're like, "Well, I I've only once seen um, seen an investor call due the debt of a convertible note. They typically just go, okay, we're just going to take more equity at this point, and then they can start mm -hmm. eating away more equity because the the idea of taking debt. I've only heard of one instance, and it was." Um, there, it was actually some very uh, real estate related investors. There are people that understood, you know, debt as it relates to real estate. And that means it comes due when you pay it. And they actually, you know, basically bankrupted their own, their own company, the company that they, that they have owned a part of. So it was, they were, they required ultimately a zero sum game and a zero sum mm -hmm. outcome because they called due the debt that couldn't be paid rather than 
convert it to you know a greater a, a round in which they could just capture more equity without further investment of money or minimal investment for greater return. But um, I've only heard of those coming due once with uh, with real estate related. Uh, hmm. investors that wanted to do that. Usually it doesn't, it doesn't serve anyone to make, to call that due when they can, couldn't be repaid anyway. It just means, haha, now yeah. I've bankrupted you. It's like, eh, well. Yeah, thanks. it's, I mean, it's helpful. I mean, if we want to get it, it's helpful if the company is in trouble and they go into bankruptcies, then you are the first, you know, one of the first in line, you know? Yeah, it's, it's interesting, helpful. For you are in line to get repaid to each of the convertible. Yeah, if there's anything to repay with. <laughs> right, exactly. exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, this is wonderful. I know that you wrote this article and you were talking about, you know, just wanting uh, folks to know, like, what your what your impressions were um, about the Telegram judgment and or at least communication. I'm not sure if it's a full on judgment. And um, are you going to be writing more articles in the future? Yeah, I, I'd love to um, partner up with some lawyers to do it with because I think there's a lot of, um, you know, legal interpretations that I, you know, I, I'm not a lawyer, but I, I come from, you know, SEC finance compliance side. So I'd love to write more. I, I would really like to write, I, I don't know, maybe a guide of how to do a security offering without, you know, expecting a letter like this. Yeah. And, I've, and I recently started, you know, working on that with a company, you know, we just started brainstorming and you know, one of the things is make sure your token is not on any exchanges, you know, don't even talk about it. And, you know, the way I think about it is just pretend that token is your equity. You know, you, know, you can't right now go trade equity on some exchange that's not regulated or that's not, um, you know, compliant with the SEC. Uh, so pretend that that's your equity up until a certain point. But I, I am going to probably write something when the judgment comes out or when there is a resolution of telegram I, i'd love to um kind yeah, of yeah absolutely get my ideas follow and, up on in, in yeah, follow up on that because it is going to be a very important precedent i think absolutely and, you know, yeah it's very good well, we've had a lot of those in in the dot coms times as well so i think it's it's moving in the right direction even, even though people are frustrated with the sec's speed and the way they do things but it is moving in the right direction yeah, I agree. I agree. Well, thank you so much for talking about this and coming on to to discuss this so some of our listeners can learn about what this latest judgment about Telegram really says and what the SEC is trying to figure out. It's just it's so yeah. odd that um that this global leader, this first world country seems to be the one that's falling the furthest behind when it comes yep. to figuring out what yep. to do with uh, new currencies. So, uh, again, thank you so much Arena. It was so nice to talk with you about this and um I just, I, you know, it's, it's nice of you to make the time from, I think, San Francisco to New York, right? Is it? Yes. Yeah. San Francisco. Thank you, Monica. Again, very much. I'm very happy to talk to you anytime, especially Absolutely. about this. <laughs> Thank you. Well, yes. And be sure to um, t reach out and let me know the next time you write something, a big thought piece, or you put out a guide, it would be great for more people mm -hmm. to see that and, uh, and know that they're going to issue a security properly, or if they're going to be able to buy securities, you know, that they weren't able to buy before. It's going to be an exciting time as these, as this asset class sort of matures. So yep. thank you so yeah, much. Definitely. Thanks. Yes. And uh, this is Monica Prophet and Arena Burkan, and we're signing off with the New Trust Economy. We'll catch you on the next episode. Thanks, you guys. You've been listening to the New Trust Economy. We'd love to hear your comments on today's show, as well as suggestions for future topics and guests. Visit us online at newtrusteconomy.com or on social at New Trust Economy. Thanks for exploring the New Trust Economy with us.